Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, bienvenidos. Tenemos hoy una conferencia de la profesora Karen Chapel que nos visita con una beca Fulbright, va a estar con nosotros unos cuantas semanas. Y bueno, tenemos la oportunidad de ver qué se está haciendo en California, cuáles son las tomas de datos, las relaciones y las consecuencias que van teniendo sobre la estrategia de planificación y la ordenación de los espacios urbanos. Eh, es un gran eh, honor tenerla aquí con nosotros y es una grandísima oportunidad para nosotros, porque realmente vamos a aprender eh, cosas que ya empezamos a ver o a escuchar en algunos otros contextos, pero vamos a poder tener una visión de primera mano de lo que se está haciendo allí. Entonces, además de agradecerle infinitamente a Karen la disponibilidad de la conferencia, me ha comentado que vamos a hacer dos partes. Hoy va a explicar la teoría del Urban Displacement y va a explicar todo lo que ella está haciendo diariamente en San Francisco. Y el lunes vamos a tener la posibilidad a las 12 de hacer un caso de estudio de los chicos del máster que tienen el seminario en líneas de investigación porque les he comentado un poco vuestro nivel de, de, bueno, de involucración en este tipo de cuestiones que además venéis de muchos sitios distintos del planeta y ella va a arrojar al final de la exposición teórica una serie de preguntas a las cuales me gustaría que reflexionarais o estudiarais o apuntarais alguna idea para poder hacer un debate con ella el lunes en clase ¿vale? o sea que eh, hoy va a ser más un poco la explicación teórica, pero el debate lo vamos a dejar para el lunes, porque ella también tiene que coger un avión dentro de unas horas, bueno, una hora y media, entonces vamos a hacerlo un poco de, de esta manera. Entonces yo creo que es una gran oportunidad eh, primero escucharla, pero luego esa segunda parte que también eh, puede tener mucha mucha interés para todos vosotros. Muy bien, pues Karen, okay. muchas gracias por estar con nosotros y bienvenida. Ok, gracias Esther. And thank you so much for welcoming here. It's um, already been a lovely week meeting students and faculty here. And I'm, I'm embarking on a very exciting adventure. I'm uh, looking at uh, d gentrification and displacement at six or seven cities around the world to start a comparative study. So this is, uh, I, I, we started in San Francisco, we're starting a project in New York, we're starting a project in London, now we're starting a project in Madrid, and in the spring I go to Buenos Aires and Bogotá, so, and Sydney, Australia. So um, it's, it's very exciting and very, very challenging too because the definitions, the conceptions of gentrification and displacement are very different in each region. And even, even within the United States, we have in my, where I'm from in California, we have a situation in San Francisco that's very different from Los Angeles. So I, I think we need to understand these kinds of global Uh, gentrification patterns and really think about the variation across uh, metropolitan areas. So what I, I want to do today was talk a little bit about our work in San Francisco and um, talk about some potentials for expanding our work and um, it, we'll try to keep it to um, about 45 minutes and we'll um, have time for questions and uh, then we'll continue uh, the discussion on Monday, um, as Esther said. So, uh, let's see, there we go. So we began this project in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, because of, of a project um, on regional planning. So California, has the strongest regional planning law in the United States. It's a very good example um, of a state law. It requires every region to plan for its new jobs and its new residents for the next 30 years. Every five years, every metropolitan area has to make a new plan. And Every metropolitan area has to plan 
to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, in every region, <laughs> um, people have to drive less. We have to get people out of their cars. It's a very big challenge. In these regions, to do this, we're building transit systems. So we have in the state of California 500 new transit stations coming. And we plan to concentrate growth around the transit stations. So those are the areas in orange here. In, the, in San Francisco, we'll put 80% of the new growth in 5% of the land in transit-oriented development. Now, this is a big problem when you have people living there already. And so there became a question about what happens with the existing residents. And this is a young man uh, que viene de Mexico, y vive in a, he lives in a suburb of, uh, of San Francisco. His family is being evicted from this building. Um, and it's because it's near the transit and the landlord can get more rent. So in the state, there's a very big concern um, that when we do smart growth, when we do regional planning, we might also have displacement. So that is the problem we need to solve. And it's a very, very hard problem in the expensive regions of the world, in the Londons, the San Francisco's, the New York's, the Paris's, this, the hot, what we call strong market regions. It's very, very hard because land costs are going up, up, and up, and up. So we began to study this problem, and we began, first of all, to think about gentrification and what we understand about gentrification. And the idea of gentrification starts in the 1960s in London. Gentrification is about working class neighborhoods, low income neighborhoods, where higher income uh, professionals come in, um, and real estate developers come in. So new capital, new residents. And this has transformed, as, as if you've been to London, you will have seen most of London has been transformed in the last 50 years by this process. Um, this takes different forms in different places. This is um, in, in San Francisco. This is in a very, very poor area of San Francisco. This is Vietnamese. So this is a Vietnamese neighborhood in San Francisco. This is a martini bar. <laughs> um, so it doesn't fit, right? It, there's some sort of disconnection uh, between the, you know, the change that's going on and the existing residents. That's what we see as gentrification. Here's another example of gentrification. This is what we say when, when we talk about gentrification, particularly in Asia, we're talking about new build gentrification. So led by new development, this new building in the middle of Chinatown and Chinese neighborhood in New York City is putting pressure on the, the uh, rental units that are around it. And eventually, the, the landlords will, will try to raise their rent. Now, in New York, these buildings are safe. Why? Because they have rent control. They have policies that help people stay in these buildings. But most places don't have protections for the renters. So in many places, the, the people that live in these, the older housing will be displaced. Uh, here's another example of gentrification. It, it happens on a house by house basis. So often we have residents, uh, homeowners. This is my friend, he bought this house in a poor area of Oakland, California. Uh, he bought it at the, at the bottom of the cycle. He fixed it up. He sold it at the top of the real estate cycle. He made a lot of money. Um, and, but he's just a guy, you know, a, a working class guy. So this is another form of gentrification. 
We call this fixer upper, is when you buy an old building, you fix it up. That's a classic kind of gentrification. Um, and then we have just this global phenomenon, and I, I pulled this picture of Shanghai, but this could be anywhere um, uh, around the world uh, where you have um, you know, new investment coming in here. These signs are new, the building is older. Um, over time, there, there's some change coming place, taking place. So what we like to do in our research um, is, is differentiate between that influx of new capital and new residents um, from the displacement of the existing residents. So we, we think about these separately analytically, and though they are very, very closely related. So this is a group uh, being evicted um, from their, their homes uh, in Chinatown in San Francisco. Um, they, uh, their landlords are kicking them out so to raise the rent. Um, and this doesn't happen everywhere. Again, sometimes you have laws in place that protect people like this, um, but sometimes you don't. And when you don't, you, you often have displacement. So that's where we started our project, was to think about the definition of gentrification, the transformation of urban working class neighborhoods because of this influx of capital, and or the higher income, higher educated residents, and displacement, um, when simply when, when households are forced to move. Um, and we also like to talk about when households can't move into a neighborhood. Um, they're excluded from a neighborhood uh, because the rents are going up in that area. Um, so this, what we find and what we argue in our research is that these this phenomenon of displacement is actually occurring in all kinds of neighborhoods. It's occurring in high income places and low income places. And I'll show you a picture of that um, in a moment. Um, and then we also think about displacement in several different ways. It, it can be physical, then maybe the, the landlord um, doesn't keep up the property. It's not habitable anymore. People move out. It could be economic, the rents go up, or it could be exclusionary. Um, in, in the whole neighborhood, prices have gone up so far that the low-income households that used to move in can't move in anymore. So we began this project. We, we were funded by the state to do, do it. We had many, many partners. Um, uh, because it was actually a mixed method uh, project, the, we, had, we worked with um, six community-based organizations, too, to help us understand what was happening on the ground in their neighborhoods. Um, you can see our results right here at urbandisplacement.org. Um, you can go there and play around with our, our um, interactive maps. Um, and, um, and let me walk you through a little bit what, what we did. Um, so again, we took a mixed method approach. Um, we did field work in several representative neighborhoods. Um, we did uh, joint interviews with uh, community-based organizations. We walked the streets. We walked around blocks um, to check our data, what we call ground truthing our data with community groups. And what was the data? It was a database that what we, is what we call multi-level. So we had data at the parcel level. We had data at the tract or neighborhood level. We had data at the city level. We had data at the regional level. We had data on demographics from the census. We had data on the housing stock. We had data on property sales and transactions. We had data on, on, uh, on uh, amenities, parks, transit. We had data on walkability. We had data on um, policies. We had data on businesses. Um, and so we put all this together into, um, into a series of uh, analyses. Um, and I'm going to go right to the, the punchline of, of what we found. So we, we tried to measure both displacement and gentrification. So 
And, and this is actually a challenge we, we, in, in wherever you are in the world. It's not like there's a ready to go data set to help you understand either gentrification or displacement. It's very hard. So we use proxies to understand what, uh, how this phenomenon might be occurring. Um, one of our proxies for displacement was change in low-income households. If you have, um, in, in, in uh, the beginning time period, you have a thousand low-income households in your neighborhood, and then at the end period, you have 900. You've lost low-income households. Um, we are a region in San Francisco that is actually gaining low-income households generally because of inequality. National patterns of inequality are written onto the city and we have a, a, a bigger gap between um, the rich and the poor. Um, in general, we, we, we're gaining low-income households, but if a neighborhood is losing no, low-income households, then we say, that must be some form of displacement happening um, because most places, on average, are gaining low-income households. So as it turns out, um, it's quite concentrated, and those are the areas in, in red, um, the areas that are losing low-income households. Now, one thing surprised us about this analysis immediately, and I'm very curious whether we would see it in Madrid if we could only get this kind of data for Madrid. What surprised us was we thought that we were only losing low-income households from the big cities. So this is San Francisco, it, it's that, la, the capital. How many, raise your hand if you've been to San Francisco? Okay, so if a few of you have, the rest of you know there's a bridge um, <laughs> a famous bridge. There's a lot of hills. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's in uh, you know more movies than any other city except maybe New York. Um, so we expected that in this area, in the other core areas where land prices were going up, we would see a lot of loss of low-income house households. We were surprised, though, to find that actually we're losing low-income households from all over the region. And so this is something that we started to investigate. Um, not, not, not across the entire region, but in pockets um, all over the, the region. So that was our first indicator we looked at. Um, the second um, indicator we looked at was the housing stock. So we were interested to see where housing had been affordable in the first time period and then was gone by the second time period. So this, this is not social housing. This is like what we would call market rate, um, market provided affordable housing. This is the, the type of housing that you see that it, it, it's, it's an older building. Over time, it declines in quality, it declines in price, and low income households or students move in. Um, this is, so this um, affordable housing stock is how we provide in the U.S. a lot of um, our affordable housing. Our, uh, we have a sort of a, a trickle down process. The market builds new units, the rich people occupy the, the new units, and the older ones get handed over or hand me down to, to, to low income households. Well, this is not happening anymore, actually. Um, we don't have trickle down. We have trickle up in many cases. So we have so much pressure on the housing market that these units that used to be affordable, older housing, are now attracting young, affluent, or even just middle class hipsters or professors or what have you um, that, that can't find other housing. And so that's putting a huge amount of pressure. And this is, um, again, the, the, the neighborhoods in red on our map are the ones that are losing this affordable housing stock. Um, a third indicator that we looked at in terms of displacement was exclusionary displacement. So the darker blue color here are the places where low-income households are moving in. 
So um, we see basically a dispersion of the low-income households to the periphery of the region. There's a few neighborhoods in the core which still admit low-income households, but in general, um, these households are being excluded from from the core. You, if you lose your if you lose your apartments in um, in, uh, in in the center of San Francisco you'll never be able to find another one, right? And this is true, of course, of neighborhoods, I would guess, um, here um, as well, a neighborhood like, I don't know, Seoul, in the center, neighborhoods towards the center. Um, so that, uh, so, um, so we still have some churning in the center city, but in general, the movement is out of the low-income households. So we put these three um, indicators of displacement together with an indicator of, of gentrification. Um, gentrification, again, we defined as new investment, new capital coming in, which we measure by housing prices going up, and new residents, high income, high educated residents. And so we developed a typology, and you can see all this on our website and read more about our methodology. Um, and we applied it to, again, the entire region because we wanted to think about the entire region, what's going on. We don't want to just look at a couple of key epicenters of gentrification, um, which in San Francisco would be the Mission District, in New York would be the Village, um, in London, I guess it's Hackney now. Um, we, we wanted to think about, again, the, the, the regional housing market because it seems clear that some of the areas in the external areas, the exurbs, are affected by what's going on in the in the um, in the core. So what we did in this map um, is we 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 created a typology that different differentiated the low income neighborhoods. Those are the ones in purple. From the high income areas, those are the ones in orange. So the darker purple are the ones where gentrification is taking place, and that's about. 10% of all neighborhoods in the region. The ones in orange are the ones, the rich neighborhoods, that are more and more exclusive. Um, and um, so we found, um, as you see by the statistic, um, that actually half of the displacement was occurring in these exclusive areas that were becoming more and more segregated, more and more affluent, and over time were losing their low income population and rents and property prices were going up so much nobody could move in. Um, so to us this again was a was a surprise to and it, it really changed the focus of what we were thinking about um, to be displacement more broadly um, rather than than gentrification um, which had been the focus of, of a lot of research to date. Um, and again, if you go on our website, you can see um, some of our definitions. We're, we're uh, about, next week we'll post an updated version of, of this data. Um, so one of the things we did differently, in addition to looking at the region, is we looked at the stages of displacement. So we looked over a very long time period. We started our analysis in 1990 and we went to 2013, now 2015. So 25 years of analysis, so 25 years of neighborhood change. And so this was to allow us to really see in depth how the process was unfolding. Because in some cases, uh, gentrification may look like it's happening overnight, but actually the seeds were planted decades before. And one of the things that um, this analysis uh, allowed us to do is we could look at what had changed in the 1990s and then how it changed um, in, in more recent times. And um, we learned from, from this analysis um, that it was actually uh, a very complicated relationship. So we thought we were going to find that there was gentrification and then displacement happened afterwards. But once we started looking at this 25-year time frame, we started understanding 
that people were getting displaced first and then the gentrification was happening. So it kind of reversed our understanding and um, it's one of the things that we're looking at uh, uh, you know, around the world um, to see whether we can actually find displacement and use it as a way to predict gentrification that might happen 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Okay, so we, I mentioned we did qualitative work as well, and so we did a set of case studies. I'm just checking how I'm doing on time. I'm going to speed up a little bit um, so we can have more of a discussion. So, um, so we did a set of case studies um, around the region, and, and we really believe that our data, um, great as it was, um, was really just a proxy and we needed to understand the stories on the ground. So we, we went around um, to different places in the region, um, which I think again would be very interesting to do um, in Madrid as well. So we, what we learned going to these places was that there were connections between all these different housing markets and there were actually what you might think of as chains of displacement occurring, where you would have people push out of the center of San Francisco and then we would find them down in the south or we would find them moving, having moved twice, maybe they moved from San Francisco to Oakland to, to, to the suburbs. Um, and then so all these places were related, and as it, it because because this the displacement in the core, um, it, it created a new market for people in the suburbs, right? So developers in the suburbs were thinking about this new market that they're going to get. Um, so the, the the housing market is working regionally. So we found that even out in the suburbs, you would have a displacement occurring. There'd be no gentrification at all, but there's displacement occurring because the developer is thinking, uh, in 10 years, in 20 years, I'm going to get those people that are pushed out of San Francisco. So I'm going to start to clear out my building so that then I can make a lot of money when, when in the next business cycle when uh, the expansion means uh, more pressure and um, they will inevitably move out um, to us. Um, so that was one of the, these interviews with developers that we did in the suburban areas made us realize that we really needed to think in the same time frames that they were thinking. Developers think in a 30-year in a time frame, you know? <laughs> they're holding land, they're waiting for when they can make the most money. And um, planners need to, to think more like developers, right? To kind of understand these, these processes. Um, so, so this made us realize that displacement's not a, not a singular event, it's a process, it's ongoing, it, it may take generations to, to happen. Um, and, um, and we need to look at the whole region to understand that. Okay, so then we went into the policy piece. And I, I would expect that this is one piece that really differs um, from country to country and from city to city quite a bit. Um, but I have a framework for thinking about policies we're thinking about anti-displacement policies that, that probably works in many different places. So I believe we need to think about the very short-term remedies, um, legal actions to save tenants that are at risk of, of losing their apartments. Um, then we sort of need to think about mid-term types of actions, so new policies that the city or the region can adopt. And then, at the same time, we need to think about the long term. We need to think in, in a 30-year time frame. So, what is this neighborhood, Lava Pies, what is it going to look like in 2040? 
right? How much is Madrid going to grow? How much pressure is that going to put on, on places even in the, in the suburbs, um, in, in the south, in the north? Um, and, and so in our plans, we need to build in policies um, and protections um, for the affordability in these areas. Um, and so we have a list. This is my, my list of my 40 favorite policies and planning mechanisms um, that we use um, in the US. And I, actually, I think particularly the planning on the planning side, a lot of them are available internationally. Um, so particularly um, on the planning side, I think impact fees and value recapture and value recapture is something you see a lot in Latin America um, and, and used in several countries um, in Europe. So when we plan for a new transit station in particular, because remember my starting point is transit, um, or, or you can think about it as when we plan for new infrastructure or we plan for new amenities, we build new parks. Whatever we're investing in, whatever the public sector is investing in, we need to think about that value it's going to confer on the area around it. And we need to think about how to recapture some of that value for the public good so it's not just for the private landowners benefiting with a, with a windfall. So value recapture is one very important one um, that we see. Um, we see um, in the US, we also see, um, for instance, reduced parking requirements. So if we reduce our parking requirements, we make it cheaper to build. We can build more affordable housing that way. Um, we, we have, in the US, we have um, um, housing trust funds, um, which um, you know, which what might tax developers when you build a new development for, and, and I know many countries in Europe have inclusionary housing. Um, money when from a new development goes e either into building affordable housing on site or into a trust fund. Um, land trusts are another option on the planning side. But we can't just think about 30 years from now. We also have to think about today at the same time. And that's what's very, very hard to do because the, the people that are working on protecting tenants, those are lawyers. And the people working on the long term are planners. Um, and so we, we sort of need to, to um, cut across the silos to, to make these policies happen. What we did in our work um, was we, we took that list of policies and then we looked at every city in the region and we, we looked at every city's statutes, yes, every city's laws to understand which of these policies did they have already. And then we put it up on a map. Um, and um, we found that this, this was actually something that had even more of an impact than our other maps because cities could see that the city next door had really good protections for its renters, but, but they didn't have anything at all. So it, it was easier for advocates to make the case um, to put in new laws. Uh, once you could kind of see it on a map, um, it, it created what we call a race to the top. Um, we have, um, we've written a little bit about our impacts. I'm not going to talk about this so much here because it, it's not going to mean much to you. Um, but this, we, we had impacts at the national level um, where the, the national government is now um, um, allowing um, the, the first, uh, the, the people that have gotten, uh, lost their housing from, from a neighborhood with displacement on the map. Um, they get first uh, dibs on new social housing that's built. Um, we've had it written into the controls in the, in the mission where you have to look at our displacement maps and analyze displacement before you can actually get your building approved. Um, we've had policies passed in a bunch of different cities and we've had the regional government 
um, you have new anti-displacement targets. So now in the regional plan, when you plan for new housing, new jobs, uh, you have to show that you're not going to displace residents. Um, so I want to wrap up by thinking a little bit about how we can move on, how we can um, expand our analysis with different kinds of data, better data, of how we can replicate it in, in different places. And um, so here we are in Madrid. What neighborhood is this? <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's Treca. Um, and um, it, so there are many, many neighborhoods that have um, already gentrified in Madrid. There's many go undergoing um, the process right now. And there are many, many neighborhoods that are just getting poorer. Um, and I think we need to sort of think about this on a regional level and how all these um, patterns are, are interrelated across, across the region. So what kind of data can we use? Um, um, I'm starting to translate my slides into Spanish, <laughs> um, um, but I didn't finish. Um, so, you know, I think we, we have um, a, a lot of potential um, in different types of databases. Um, in New York, which is where one place we're starting to work, we, we have really a beautiful data set from, from the building department um, on the city level. Um, building by building, um, what are the um, alterations, the, what are the building permits that have been given out. Um, Craigslist, this is, a, this is an analysis my um, undergraduates did um, in, in San Francisco. They looked at, at, at Craigslist, which I guess is comparable to Ide Idealista here. So Craigslist the, has a, uh, apartments for rent. And um, so uh, they, they looked at um, housing price increases. Those are the, the brown dots um, in proximity to the Google bus. Um, there's a bus that Google sends all over San Francisco and wherever it lands, um, hipsters come and they, <laughs> um, they, rent, they, they pay a lot of rent um, to pack into places together. Um, so, um, so we can start to map this and this is one thing we're going to do on our maps is add a layer that has um, real time just about real-time information on rent increases um, so that as our data, as our secondary data from the census, as it gets old, we can keep it continually refreshed by pointing out where the rents are going up fastest. Um, one thing that we're working on in New York, again, because New York has great data, is the role of amenities. New, uh, New York City has a database of trees. Do you guys have a database of trees? You do? <gasps> oh. So trees are complicated. Um, <laughs> trees are a little bit, you, you can't just say there's a tree, rents are going to go up. Um, right, you kind of you need to know when the tree was planted, how mature it is, whether uh, uh, whether it's doing well. Um, but but we think we we've already seen some correlation between parks and uh, gentrification and displacement. Um, so uh, you know I think other types of amenities um, need to be investigated. Another thing we're looking at is, is uh, GTFS data. Do you guys have this here? Um, general transit feed data. I think you might. It's in many, many different cities where it, it's data on, on uh, real-time uh, transit schedules. Um, um, it has travel times and headways between, um, between buses and subways. And um, it's a really a more powerful way of thinking about um, accessibility. So you can think about it on a block by block neighborhood level instead of a neighborhood level, which is what we had been doing before. Um, so uh, we should be able to really um, identify, identify pockets of um, high accessibility and relate it to, to housing price uh, um, changes nearby. 
Um, another project that we're just starting to look at um, is Airbnb data, um, building on some work that folks at University College London have done. They linked uh, Airbnb data in London and San Francisco to gentrification and found a relationship um, between the two. So in gentrifying neighborhoods, you had a much higher likelihood of putting your apartment on, on the market in, on Airbnb. So that's something we want to look at. Um, and uh, this is actually a, um, a, an analysis using Spanish credit card data, um, an analysis that was uh, done by researchers at, at BBVA. Um, and uh, so this is a type of data it's hard to get. Um, some folks have been lucky enough to get it. Um, it's, it's a database of actual transactions where you have the, where, where a person lives and where they're buying things. And I think this type of data is going to help us understand activity patterns much better. It's going to help us understand um, whether, again, there is exclusion from certain types of neighborhoods. Um, we can sort of verify that orange on, on my map. Um, we, and we can also understand if there's isolation, if, if low-income neighborhoods um, are, um, uh, the, the people living there are not going outside to, to purchase things. So there, there are many, many different research questions that I think this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. And finally, this is my last slide, um, one of the things um, that I'd like us to build up is our story mapping potential. So, you know, um, our maps are very pretty, but in the end, you know, if we could have the voices of the people living there um, embedded in the maps, I think we would have a much more powerful um, experience. Um, this is a story map that a colleague of mine did with her students on Washington, D.C. Um, I had my undergraduates do story maps this last year and they loved it. Um, it's really, really fun. There's a lot of great interfaces to do it. Um, so a lot of potential there to, to really put voices on the map. So um, that's the end of my presentation, and I would love to have some discussion and questions. Right. Um, so we we've we've had we've seen movement on all levels. Um, the issue, though, is um, where's the power? <laughs> and most of the power um, in the in um, in our federalist structure is in the national government and and the state government, and so. And I think it's it's quite similar, right, in Spain. So uh, the the cities don't have that much power. The regions don't have that much power. Um, so that um, that means that uh, you need. It, it's very difficult to pass new laws at the state level or the 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 you know, departmental level and, or the national level because the country is so diverse, right? You have, uh, you know, maybe you don't have the same problem in Malaga that you have in Madrid or Barcelona, right? And so the national government can't pass a law. And so we have that problem in the U.S. Um, we, we were lucky that in, we had a state, our state of California, which passed a law that regions had to comply with for regional planning. So in our context, regions control all the transportation money. And so transportation money is the key, right, to doing um, affordable housing protection. Um, and so as long as we can, I, I think our job is to keep 
making sure that residents and politicians, legislators understand the link between housing and transportation. So then, then you can have them build in the protections into the transportation plans and, and investment. I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first, you mentioned there's a, a, a web you used to publish right Yeah. The ur urbandisplacement.org. Let's see, we go back. Yeah, I give it to you again. And we have a lot of this. We have so many reports and so forth up there. And the second one, um, is it the, the purpose of the study is only just to understand why gentrification is happening? Or is there going to be at some level um, a part when you start making, I don't know, some proposals to what could you change in either cities depending on what's happening? Yeah. Yeah, I, the um, the idea, yes, exactly. You, I mean, we start by identifying the causes, and in particular, the relationship between transit and and gentrification and displacement, and then um, then we're working on building building into the laws that now you have to plan for you have to plan for displacement. You have to plan how are you going to protect the people when you invest public money in the area. Um, so you know, ultimately, it, it, it's going to have to. It, we want it to have a policy impact. I mean, it's had some policy impact, and then, then you. But you have to build in those, uh, you know, into all of your different types of legislation. It's complicated, right? <laughs> There's a lot of things that touch a neighborhood. So yeah. And the last one. Yeah. Um, how did you choose the cities you're going to be visiting on Latin America? Oh well, so. Um, I, I was trying to find places that had good data, high inequality, <laughs> issues of, of gentrification and displacement. Um, and really, really, there were many different cities I could go to. And Santiago w w was another very logical choice. Um, I have a very hard time understanding Spanish in Chile. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, and <laughs> in Colombian Spanish, it's very easy for me. Um, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, but yeah, there were many different cities um, that I could have gone to. Bogota has very good data because it has the data on stratification. Um, and then Buenos Aires has, has a history of community resistance to gentrification, which I think is very interesting. So it, it, you know, I think you could probably look at most of the cities in, um, in Latin America. I spoke with the BID. I work often at the Banco Intermercano de Desarrollo, and they, the, they felt like there, there's very good data in, the best data is in Rio and Sao Paulo, but I have no Portuguese, so. <laughs> and they like to speak Portuguese, I know. They don't want me to go and speak Spanish. Um, <laughs> so just a matter so, of, of yeah. easiness, and not because <laughs> yes, it yes. is more um, some, accurate to go yeah. those cities. So. Yeah, yeah. So some basic criteria and then some personal criteria. Do you have other suggestions for me? No, it's just that yeah. I'm, I'm actually Colombian. But oh, okay. I, I'm actually Colombian, but I've lived in Mexico, Venezuela as well. Yeah. And uh, right. I found Mexico more challenging yeah. than many other cities, uh, perhaps in Latin America, because of the size of the city. Yes, I think so it's, yeah. It's I just want to know why you choose those. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I would have, I could have chosen Mexico City. It was very high on my list, too. Because there's very good data in Mexico. Yeah, yeah so. Um, but maybe next, in, in five years, <laughs> have to start somewhere. <laughs> How are we, the Marilenios, what? are we doing on, on, on data? <laughs> we'll find out, right? <laughs> I'm going to talk to you guys. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm learning about Madrid. So we'll, we'll find out. And I think, I think probably we have to make compromises and see what we can do. Um, okay, one, okay, one, yeah, go ahead. Okay, two more questions. And then. I have a question about the causes of the gentrification in the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, 
why do you think it has started uh, strongly during the 1990s? Mm. Do you think there's a strong relation between the gentrification process and the boom of Silicon Valley? Yes, or absolutely. Or are there other factors? Like no, that? that's no, that's a very good question. It's number one is the business cycle. And so what happens is we, you know, the business cycle in a in a in a upturn of the business cycle, we can add jobs much faster than we can add housing, right? So it quickly becomes out of balance. And that's when we see all the pressure on the existing housing is in that business cycle. So, so it happens in the late 1980s, it happens again in the late 1990s, it happens again in the middle of the 2000s, and it happens now. So we already have a you know, four time cycles that it's been happening in. So we didn't have it so much in the 1970s. Um, I mean, London started much earlier, right? And New York, the early accounts are, are all about New York and London and Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question was more towards the transportation and transit aspect. Yeah. Um, because I, I understand this place and has kind of radius wave-like effect, as you said, the, the links in the yeah. chain. And I mean, I'm from LA, so I know that public transit is pretty tough. Especially yes. In California. Getting better. Well, <laughs> slowly. Um, but so there is like that distance effect. Yeah. yeah. Because this did start with the transit point of view. Mm -hmm. Would displacement not be considered a problem if public transport could be implemented? Or what's the time frame to kind of, kind of what was the intention of the transit and the displacement? If well, so transit is um, it, it's an interesting uh, factor to study because it's a, sort of a shock to the system. And there actually aren't, if you're a researcher, when you're thinking about shocks, I mean, there's natural disaster, which is another very interesting shock to look at. But in terms of, uh, you know, catalytic public investment, um, right now in California, it's transit. Um, 30 years ago, maybe it was urban renewal. Um, and certainly, you know, in, in other places, what we, in Rio, right, it's the Olympics <laughs> um, and the World Cup. Um, so you have these catalytic things. It just so happens in California, it's, it's transit. And then transit, I, I also think, it, it just in the nature of its, um, its development, because it is typically 20 years or 30 years to develop, there's a lot of potential to build in protections, to build in equitable development into a transit line that maybe you didn't really have, say, in Rio with the Olympics, where it was, let's get this built in two, two years, um, and so many people got displaced. Um, so so that's, that's why the focus. Um, so, I think I'm going to wrap up here uh, because uh, you know I know um, your time is valuable. You need to go back to work, and <laughs> um, or um, and I'm going to have another chance to speak with with both the masters and PhD students on Monday. So I will see you then. Thank so you. thank you for coming. <laughs>